uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Kevin Boonon, who is currently an associate professor in the Department of Human and Evolutionary Biology at the Harvard University. Kevin is a paleoecologist that focuses on how climate is affecting mammals and humans. And he got his PhD at the University of Utah and has been working at, as a, a research assistant at the Columbia University ever since. And it is our pleasure today to have him speak about dear Paranthropos. What type of food did you eat? Or WTF? <laughs> Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, sir. <laughs> you can leave that. Today I'm going to talk about um, the relationship between diet and evolution, particularly human evolution. Uh, and I'm going to take a different tack and I'm not going to fo focus on us. A lot of the discussion of human evolution is about us, us, us. And this is a, a talk about Paranthropus, um, an extinct hominid. Uh, the last one lived about a million, million point two years ago. Uh, and this is a letter, this is a Valentine's Day, it's a love letter to Paranthropus asking, uh, dear Paranthropus, uh, WTF did you eat? Where that stands for um, what types of food did you eat? And I'll try to explain why um, understanding the diet of organisms, especially extinct organisms, helps us understand their paleobiology, their, their, um, their ecology in the past. And this, this letter here, it's called an aerogram. This is a pretty young crowd, it looks like, for the most part. <laughs> And long ago, in the late Holocene, uh, when I first started in graduate work in Kenya, I would get these aerograms, and it was a single sheet of paper, blue on the outside, lined on the backside, and you could write letters home. So, dear mom and dad, I'm in a tent in the middle of nowhere in Kenya, it's hot, I'm tired, I'm dusty, etc. And then you fold the piece of paper up, it's a single sheet of paper, the paper becomes an envelope, it's pre-stamped, and you can send it anywhere in the world. It costs like a dollar or something like that. So I found an old, you can't find them really anymore because nobody does this, but I wrote many home to my family. Um, and so this is one that I, I wrote to Paranthropus, uh, and hopefully you'll, we'll dive into a little bit why understanding the diet helps us understand the evolution and particularly how we got here. Okay, um, and since it's Darwin Days and we're celebrating the 216th birthday of Charles Darwin this week. Uh, I thought I'd start with just some notes, not direct quotes, um, but just notes on his thoughts on the role of diet and evolution. So I'll let you read those for a moment. And clearly Darwin uh, thought about the role of resources, resource acquisition, feeding habits, etc., uh, on survival, fitness, and reproduction. He, he also got uh, into the idea of um, seasonal availability of food, things like that, and so really at the granular level about the role of resources uh, in evolution. Okay, so uh, as Sarah mentioned, uh, thank you for the introduction, Sarah, wherever you are. Uh, and also, Ryan, thank you for the invitation to speak. Sorry, I should have started with that. Um, I'm a paleoecologist, and so I try to understand past environments and um, both the, the vegetation and ecology, uh, the hydroclimate or like rainfall, and also the organisms that live in those environments and how those are all linked. And that's sort of um, highlighted in this schematic here on the left, or the right, sorry, my left. Um, and the principal question my research group asks is, um, how did climate change influence major shifts uh, in terrestrial ecosystems and what were the evolutionary consequences, okay? And we can break that down into a couple bigger questions. Uh, the first being, what caused the emergence of the world's tropical and subtropical grasslands starting about 10 million years ago? So grasslands are a new feature on Earth, relatively speaking. Um, and <clears throat> I won't dive too deeply into that today, but it's related to us and the evolution of hominins, our group, because we are a very grassy species. If you think about what you had for breakfast this morning, it is probably a grass-derived product. I'll tell you, I had yogurt and granola, 
So yogurt comes from cows that eat grass. Granola is a grain, uh, oats, which is a type of grass. And I can drink coffee without creamer, but I prefer it with creamer, which comes from grass. So we have a really grassy diet. You can think about your lunch, your dinner, as long as you don't get hungry here. But we are a really grassy based species. And that will come through in the talk today, although I won't talk about necessarily the evolution of grasslands. I'm gonna focus on this second question. Uh, did climate and vegetation play a significant role in the evolution of humans and other large mammals? And this schematic kind of shows the linkages between climate variables, like the amount of rain an ecosystem gets, uh, what the CO2 levels are in the atmosphere. Plants take in CO2, right, to, to produce uh, photosynthate and to grow. Uh, and then temperature plays a huge role in what kind of plants can grow in an ecosystem. So these are climate variables on the left. In the ecosystem, we have um, things that control vegetation structure. So tree mortality, okay, depends on things like fire or herbivory. And then we have uh, this balancing act between grassy and woody ecosystems. So you can think of a pure uh, grassland like in the Serengeti or woodlands or forest. There's a huge range of, of ecosystems in Africa where, where the work that I present comes from today. Okay, so focusing on this second question, okay, did climate and vegetation play a significant role in how we got here? Um, we have these, this sort of patchy fossil record. Maybe you've seen sort of um, phylogenies like this where we have some fossil and then we think it gave rise to other species, things like that. And what we're exploring is the link between climate. So here's some, let's just call it climate data of maybe where, where these hominins were running around on the earth. And then here we have a, a more global record of say temperature, ice volume or something. And how do we link different scales, so global records of climate or regional records of vegetation with the fossil record that's a little bit patchy. Um, well, first we need to generate these global records, local records of you know, vegetation, climate, etc. Uh, and then we need to generate this record. And this one, we, we know how to do, and we've been doing it for a very long time. Okay, and that is, we, we just go to the fossil record. Okay, it's an amazing, amazing archive of the story of us. And here is um, the Leakey family. This is Mary Lewis and one of the sons, it's probably Richard Leakey, at Olduvai Gorge, uh, probably in the early 1950s or so, uh, with one of their many Dalmatian dogs that they kept. And here in Olduvai Gorge uh, is where Mary discovered uh, this particular hominin. This is Paranthropus boisei. Uh, originally called Zinjanthropus, but the genus name was eventually changed, or was named before, actually. It's a complicated story. Anyway, this is um, Paranthropus. This is OH5, Olduvai hominin 5. It's a specimen number. It's famous because it's a skull. Oftentimes you find a tiny tooth or something, but occasionally you get lucky and find a skull. So the hominid fossil record has been in the process of being assembled over the last century or so, and it continues to grow. Um, this is my uh, colleague Isaiah Nango, who sadly passed away several years ago. Um, one of the, the first um, Kenyan paleoanthropologists who studies human evolution. And in Tur the Turkana Basin, where Dr. Mana and I work, um, Isaiah discovered in 2014 this um, baby ape skull. You can hold it in the palm of your hand, and it's 13.3 million years old. It's absolutely incredible. They did some synchrotron scanning of it, and you can see the molars forming up in the crypt, still inside the jaw. And it's provide a, a, a beautiful window into the evolution of apes 13 million years ago. So the fossil record has produced some pretty amazing um, specimens that tell us how we got here. But the fossil record is incomplete. So I'm going to spend a little time on this diagram um, so that I hopefully can convince you that even though the fossil record is beautiful and amazing, it leaves something to be desired. So let's take our um, hypothetical hominin in orange here, okay? And its species range through four different time slices, time one, two, three, four, going up the y-axis, is outlined in orange. So in time one, it's here, time two, it's widely spread, times three, it shifts sort of to the northeast, and time four, 
to the west. That's the, the real sort of range of this, this particular organism through time. The circles, A, B, C, D, E, F, are fossil localities, okay? If it's a white open circle, that means that no fossils are found there at the particular site. If it's green, that means at that time period, there are fossils. So time one, okay, our hypothetical hominin is around and it's in the southern range. Here are the ranges here, okay? But because the circles are open, we never find fossils of it. It doesn't mean it never existed, it just means it wasn't recorded in the fossil record, okay? Uh, in time two, we see that our hypothetical hominin has expanded its range to south and then up the Rift Valley into Eastern Africa. And we see it at these two sites and this site. And at this site, C, that wasn't part of its home range, but there are fossils, okay? So we end up having this real record in orange. Okay, a second challenge, in addition to our incomplete fossil record, is that um, we have different scales of questions and evidence. So on the left, this is the scales of our questions, and you can pick a question up there. I'm going to talk about diet today. Um, and on the right, we have scales of evidence, okay? So you need to, the point of this plot is to say your um, question should be answered by evidence at the appropriate scale, and our axes are space, it's a log-based scale of square kilometers, and uh, time, they're the same on both in years, log base scale years. So um, something like a fossil site where you find say, a fossil you know, footprints or something or some fossils can answer really local questions, small scale questions, but important. What was the paleo environment of a particular hominin fossil occurrence? Okay, and then you can scale up to longer time scales about say macroevolution or biogeography but then your um, scales of evidence need to also expand. So if you want to ask about biogeography, you should be looking at, at a basin scale, um, something like perhaps this or this, okay? So <clears throat> this is a nice roadmap that um, my colleague Tyler Faith published, telling us all, don't scale jump. Don't ask a uh, macroevolutionary question with you know, a data set that's not appropriate, it's too small scale. So you can check me on that and make sure I follow those rules today. Okay, I know all the biologists got out of class this week, but you still get one very short class today. It's like three slides long. It's called Hominins 101. <laughs> this is uh, the fossil record of the hominin lineage. It's the hominini are a tribe in the group or the family hominidae, which includes great apes uh, and us, so gorillas, chimps, etc. Uh, the earliest uh, purported hominins stretch back to about 7 million years. It's Sahelanthropus chadensis from uh, Central Africa, from Chad, uh, Auroran tugenensis from Central Kenya, and Ardipithecus kadaba and Ramidus from the Awash in Ethiopia. Okay. These are relatively small hominins, small brain, small body, short limbs, probably bipedal. We think most of them were bipedal, meaning walking on two legs but we're able to climb much better than we can. Okay, and then we have uh, the Australopithecines here coming on the scene around 4.3, 4 4.2 million years ago. And here, this one, Afarensis, Australopith Australopithecus Afarensis, uh, is Lucy. Lucy's 50 years old this year, was discovered in 1974 at Hadar by um, Don Johansson and colleagues. And then this is where you get the split. And, and remember the, how incomplete the fossil record is. Okay, this is our, our sort of the way most people lay it out. And it's grouped into to grades, okay? And so there's a grade that goes off to the right and a grade that goes off to the left, okay? And that happens to be Paranthropus and us, okay? We're way up here, right? Um, this is a Paranthropus skull. These two are Paranthropus skulls. And the, most defining feature is the sagittal crest there, you can see, right? So if you saw like, um, you know, uh, Homo erectus walking down the street, you probably just walk by, be like, okay. But if you saw one of these walking down the street, it would be, you would turn your head and stop and stare because they were very different. They were, well, I'll, go, I'll show you the next couple slides, but 
Morphologically, they were very different than us. You would not mistake them for us, whereas something like Homo erectus uh, or Homo ergaster, you might. Okay. See, we're already in the next course. Hominin is 102. <laughs> Uh, so plotted here, we have age from 3 million years ago to present on the x-axis and two y-axis. This is probably the easiest one to look at. This is brain size and the cranial volume in cubic centimeters. So whoever just won that water bottle, can you hold it up? Okay, so that's one liter. That's here. It's not so far from the size of our brains today, the, the total volume, 1.2 liters or so. 1,200 cc's. And uh, here's Paranthropus in circles uh, through time, and here's um, ho the Homo lineage through time in terms of brain size. So you can see there's two, two relatively different trends. Okay, there's, um, this is Paranthropus increase in brain size going from somewhere around 400 maybe to five or 600 cc. And then here's us uh, starting at around 600 and, and skyrocketing up, essentially doubling in size, okay? So uh, big brains win, obviously. We're here, they're not. I'm kidding, that's a simplified version. And then on the right here, we have the, the body plans. And again, I mentioned Paranthropus is very different looking. It has, it's much shorter. It has this sort of flared rib cage, okay, where ours is more narrower. There's difference in the pelvises. Uh, and then uh, the limb bones are very different. We have much longer legs, right? Look at the femurs there, okay? It's important to note that the bones that have been found for a Paranthropus that have been really connected to that species, postcranial, uh, are very few. They're shown in the sort of shaded uh, sections there. So, and because Homo and Paranthropus were uh, around at the same time, if you find an isolated bone, it's hard to say which, which genus it belongs to. Okay, so here's a quick summary of Paranthropus. Um, and I think if I do this, Okay, so here's the skull, here's the sagittal crest, okay? And as the, the 3D rendering rotates, I want you to notice how flat and, and prognathic or sloped the face is, okay? Compared to us, where our face is very, very flat, okay? It also has this huge zygomatic arch here, all right? So there's some morphological differences that I'll explain why we think they were there, but a very different skull compared to a human skull, okay? Um, with the teeth, I'm going to now focus on the jaw, the lower jaw here. It has an incredibly robust mandible. Uh, the bony structure here is very thick and tall and wide. And then the most remarkable thing are the teeth, okay? So the, these huge flat teeth and even the premolars here have become molarized or inflated so that you have this huge amount of chewing surface. So uh, everybody look at your thumb. Okay, so that's about the size of the occlusal or chewing surface of a Paranthropus molar. Okay, now look at your pinky, put it next to it like this. And that's about the size of your average molar in a human. So massive, massive teeth. Thick enamel, very, very thick enamel. And so the question is why do they have these teeth? It's been a question since the beginning. So, uh, and speaking of which, the beginning is uh, in 1938, Paranthropus robustus, so same genus but from South Africa, was discovered at Krom Dry Cave. It's around 2.2 .2 to 2.1 million years. It's a pretty limited window, and we don't actually know the um, phylogenetic relationship. They're in the same genus, but people argue if, they're, if it's convergent evolution, you know, the large teeth and the sagittal crest of the South African robustus versus the East African species, which are Ethiopicus and Boisei. So, Ethiopicus is the first. It was around about 2.6, 2.3 million years ago. And then uh, Boise is the, the younger variant, which was around for almost a million years. Pretty long run. We've only been here 300,000 years, humans. So. Uh, and this, this is OH5 discovered by Mary Leakey at Old Divide Gorge. So, early diet estimates based on the tooth morphology structure First, uh, Leakey suggested it was carnivorous, hypercarnivorous. Uh, then later, many thought it was a hard object feeder and it became known as Nutcracker Man, okay? Because uh, seeds and nuts have really high caloric density. They're great food, but uh, it wreaks havoc on your teeth. If you've ever chipped a tooth, you know what I'm talking about, okay? 
All right. Uh, so where did Paranthropus live? Yeah. Are the incisors that big? That's the root. It's showing the root. Yeah. They just have really deep roots. Ours have pretty deep roots. Not that deep. Not that deep. Yeah. So it's very deeply rooted. Everything's robust about these things. <laughs> they're, they're called megadon. So big teeth. It's called the megadon clade or grade of hominid. Okay. So where did Paranthropus live? These are sites where we have um, found Paranthropus fossils. So here's a uh, Southern in Tanzania and uh, southern Kenya, Olduvai, Laetoli Peninj, and then moving up into uh, Kenya. Interestingly, it's never been found in Ethiopia. Highly, highly fossiliferous. That's where you know lots of Lucy-like things have been found, and many, many early Homo fossils. Oldest Homo is from up here, uh, but it stretches all along the Rift Valley, even down all the way to Malawi. This was a key site found in the 90s that expanded the range. Remember that earlier plot of where, where were these hominids living? Um, way far south uh, to the southern rift, okay? So yeah, again, where did Paranthropus really live? Maybe we don't know yet. People are really confused why it's never been found here. Was there a biogeographic barrier? Is the environment not right? We don't know. Or did we just not found the fossils? And then uh, most recently, this last fall, um, a new Paranthropus site was discovered here on the Homa Peninsula of Lake Victoria. It extended the age back to 2.8 million years, so I have to update that previous slide, and the range. Okay, so these things are always changing. Yeah? Um, I was just wondering if you happen to know what the, the ranges of time are for T1 through T4. Oh, it's just hypothetical. It's like a, an exercise in what, what, is, what do we actually know and what really happened. Oh. Yeah, good question. Okay, so uh, why should we be studying or interested in the diets of these things or even us? Okay, uh, well, animals interact most of their environment when they're feeding, so there's a lot of information about their ecology through their feeding habits, how much time they spend, where they go, what they eat. Uh, is it a seasonal available resource? Is it available year round? Uh, and from that, we can begin to ask in the case of us, and I showed this earlier, the encephalization or the massive expansion of our brains, uh, did diet lead to our big brains? The answer is almost decidedly yes, because um, the brain is a really expensive tissue or organ to run, and we need a lot of calories for that. Okay. Um, also, diet informs us about what's available, what's on the menu, habitat resources, gives us some idea for uh, niche breadth, so what this, whatever organism can eat or survive on, and is it competing with other things in that ecosystem. Um, it can inform us about how food drives selection of dental phenotypes, thicker enamel versus thinner enamel, big teeth, small teeth. Uh, and an important point is that fossil teeth provide a record of diet in, in many different ways. Okay, so um, here's, here's some examples of um, how we can study diet. Um, and the important thing is that the morphology or the shape, what these early studies were looking at, are recording sort of macroevolutionary processes. So those are out here. And we've got on the y-axis uh, time here. So studies of like um, collecting dung and things tell us kind of about the last meal or the last few meals. So things modern ecologists do. Or you can look at stomach contents or field observations. Those operate over the time scale of like, you know, a day to a year or something like that. And in the fossil record, we use a variety of different techniques. I'll talk about microware briefly uh, and stable isotopes. And those span years, centuries, millennia because we have the advantage of looking into deep time. Okay? Um, so the morphology tells us what the organism was able to eat, what it long-term evolved to eat. Uh, but these things like microware, which is the scratches on the surface of the teeth, and isotopes give us week to season to annual scale time windows. So it's what it indeed, it, what it was really eating, not what it was designed to eat. And those don't always match up, okay? All right, so microware uh, tells us about pits and scratches on a tooth. And if you're crushing like a hard object versus shearing, uh, if you watch a, a horse or a cow eat, they do a lot of shearing, right? It's sort of like this with the teeth, okay? And so they, we've done this microware analysis, we, the community, not me, uh, and we look at something called complexity, which tells us are they accessing softer or harder foods? And in the case of Paranthropus, here's the South African one, Robustus, and here's the East African one, Boisei, they have pretty low complexity suggesting softer foods. This was a big surprise and was the first 
nail in the coffin for the Nutcracker Man uh, hypothesis. And now I'm going to move into stable isotope methods. And this is the one slide where you just need to pay attention for a quick second, because most of the talk is based on this principle here. OK. Um, carbon isotopes are stable isotopes that exist in nature. We are all about 1% carbon-13. It's not radioactive. And the rest of us, carbon-12. Tiny bit of, tiny, tiny bit of carbon-14 in us. OK? Uh, in Africa today, and over the past 10 million years, trees and shrubs, which produce foods like uh, leaves, seeds, fruits, and nuts, use the C3 photosynthetic pathway. And that has a very distinct carbon isotope ratio. And all grasses, all, pretty much all lowland grasses in Eastern Africa uh, are C4 grasses. And they have a very distinct carbon isotope signature. And that also includes some sedges and then their underground storage organs like tubers or corms. Okay? So using carbon isotopes, we can tell if something is uh, browsing or using eating uh, fruits and nuts from, from C3 plants or grasses. There are obviously seeds of grasses, right? We eat them all the time. But we can dis differentiate between these two food types using isotopes. And these isotopes are stored in our teeth as your teeth form through your childhood and into your adulthood when you finish forming your wisdom teeth. So we can go back. This is a broken fossil tooth of uh, Australopithecus from Ethiopia. Here's the enamel, this dark part. When it fossilizes, it turns dark. And we just drill here, remove some powder, put it in a vial, take it home, measure the carbon isotope ratio, and Voila, we have the diet of that particular hominin from, this is 3.4 million years ago or something like that, okay? Carbon tells us about the diet, the proportion of C3 browse to graze that was in it, and oxygen tells us about its body water, its environment, okay? So uh, you are what you eat and drink. Okay, so now we're gonna dive into uh, some data from Northern Kenya, Southern Ethiopia. This is the Turkana Basin where uh, the Leakey family worked for many, many decades. They're still active, in fact, Louise Leakey. Uh, and there are three main geological formations here, the Shungura, the Nachukui, and the Kubifor. And they're all pretty much the same age. They just have different names because they're far apart from each other. But at some point, some geologists realized, hey, wait a minute, these are all the same. They're tied together. We still call them by different names, but they, they all represent the same time period of about four to one million years, key time in human evolution. And so they were all tied together by um, volcanic ash layers. So here's the uh, Shingura formation in the north, the Nachikui in the west, could be more in the east. And this is uh, the thickness of the outcrops of the stratigraphic unit compiled. So in the Omo, up here, there's about 700, almost a kilometer thick of sediments, and we can date the ashes in the Rift Valley. These volcanoes are erupting all the time. You can see 3.4, 3. .4, 3 point, can't read that, zero or something, one million years. But we have an amazing, amazing age control because of the volcanic activity of the Rift Valley to precisely date these fossils. So we know how old they are very precisely, and we can also tie those volcanic ash layers because they have chemical fingerprints that are unique. So if we find it here, we can look for it here and fingerprint it. And in that way, these lines tie exact time horizons together. And in this way, we can integrate the entire fossil record of this whole basin and ask questions about human evolution. So it's the richest hominin record in all of Eastern Africa. It's the best dated. And people have begun to notice regional differences, whether you're living along a major axial river or on the shoreline of a paleo lake. It's just a wonderful uh, sort of test bed for evolutionary theory and, and study. OK, so uh, about a decade ago, uh, we published the first data set of hominin diet. And it came from these two formations around the lake. And here we have age from four to four million years to present. And here we have the, the carbon isotope value, but I just put the tree in the grass here so you know if it's a C3 diet or a C4 diet. So leaves, seeds, nuts, etc., and grassy. Okay? And then these are the various hominin taxa we analyzed, starting with uh, Australopithecus anamensis, Kenyanthropus. 
And then throughout the talk, all the purple dots are paranthropus. And the, anything in blue is some blue diamonds or some variety of, of the genus Homo. So the important takeaway is early on, this particular taxon was just eating C3 foods. And then when we moved to Kenyanthropus, suddenly there's a huge increase in the breadth of their diet, including C3, but also mixed feeding, combining C3 and C4 foods. So we know that's an, an expansion of the dietary niche, okay? Then the record in this part of the basin is pretty silent between about, I don't know, 2.8 and 2.2. There's a few fossils, but there's not a lot. So there's this huge gap. There's a gap here and obviously a huge gap here. But this is where something interesting happens. We go from the Australopithecines to these two new genera, Paranthropus and Homo. And you can see from the plot, there's a huge amount of dietary difference between Paranthropus up here and Homo down here. There's very little overlap. So it's almost like they said, okay, they're at the grocery store and like, you can have that aisle, I'm gonna have this aisle, right? There's niche separation, okay? So that was um, 10 years ago and it was the first comprehensive data set we had of hominin diet through time using this isotopic method. Uh, in 2020, uh, this group, John Wynn et al. looked at the hominin fossils in Ethiopia same age, but they really keyed in on this fossiliferous region from about 2.7 to 2.2, so it sort of fills this gap, and the numbers are more or less the same. Sorry, the writing's a little small, but purple's Paranthropus, and blue is Homo. And it, suddenly the story's a little bit more complicated, right? You see blue and, and purple overlapping, which you don't really see here, okay? So it, this just so easy story is now suddenly like, ah, complicated, right? Furthermore, they did some uh, change point analysis and found that uh, in general, there, there are some early paranthropines down here and Homo, and then at 2.4 million years, they all slid up this dietary scale and began incorporating much more C4 in their diet. So the question is why? Is there an environmental driver to that? Okay, so we have these two data sets. Of course, we have to add a third data set. So in 2019, I went to the, muse the National Museum in Ethiopia with my colleagues, and this is our taxi driver every day. Uh, and these are all the hominin fossils, these isolated teeth. They don't let you like drill or sample teeth that are in these beautiful skulls. We, we work on isolated, generally broken teeth that we can identify the species, but are not morphologically as valuable, okay? And, from that previous slide on the methods, we mostly sample broken teeth because we can see the enamel dent injunction. It's just really uh, the right thing for everybody. Anyway, all these little, um, they're like film canisters, uh, if anybody knows what a film can is, <laughs> uh, with the specimens in them. And so we go and I put on this uh, little visor that magnifies things and you take a Dremel, a little tiny dental bit, and you drill some powder. So we went and um, drilled, I don't know, about 80 or 90 teeth of hominins, but also lots of primates, baboons, cercopithecoids, all these things. Uh, importantly, we're also adding something called um, calcium isotopes, which tells us about perhaps trophic level, something that this carbon isotope method doesn't tell us about. Uh, and so our goal was to contextualize hominid data with herbivore and carnivore isotope data, so what everyone else was eating on the landscape, add new data, um, and then at the end I'm going to talk about actually trying to characterize the ecosystem itself. Okay, so here's uh, our data from this region, the OMO, and again we see that uh, Australopithecus had mostly C3 diet but varied, maybe contracts through time, the pink shrinks into a narrow vertical range, and again, we have this C3 sort of diet for Homo and Paranthropus down here, and then shifts up here, and they're, they're all mixed up still, okay? So if we, we overlay, uh, oh, and we see, as the previous group did, the same 2.4 million year dietary shift. Uh, blah, 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 yes, okay. So now I'm putting all three studies together. It's a messy plot, all right? <coughs> The key points are that uh, in the Pliocene, which is this geological window here, okay, we see the dietary breadth increase, and that's shifting from this 
particular taxon, Australopithecus anamensis, to a new genus, Kenyanthropus platyat, and Australopithecus, and they have a much, so this huge opening up of hominin diets. That's a key, so a key question is what led to this massive expansion in ecological or dietary niche breadth? We see contraction of the Australopith diet, so it goes from really broad, these dark pink squares, to really narrow. We see this shift in the OMO, and then eventually we see this niche partitioning between Paranthropus and Homo, and they, they take their own aisles of the, the grocery store. Okay? Um, so we have to go back to our handy guide of are we asking the right questions at the right scale? And uh, I would say yes. We're trying to understand uh, ecosystem change and diet, and we're looking at outcrop based. Uh, Records, fossil records have been collected over, you know, the fossils we analyzed were collected essentially over the last century. So we're working off the efforts of many, many people over many, many years, okay? And this particular place in southern Ethiopia, the Omo Valley, has some fossil sites, so a fossil collection area might be half the size of this room, okay? So really, really localized. And in some of these small areas, we find many, many hominins, uh, relatively speaking. So we can actually get to a very granular scale. So here I'm plotting the carbon isotope ratio here. So this is diet, C3 versus C4. And this is oxygen. Uh, remember this tells us something about their drinking water, leaf water, their sort of body water signal. Uh, and again, purple and blue represent the two gene genera we're interested in. And you can see that in carbon space, they're pretty close and they're almost identical in the oxygen space. So pretty similar diets here at a single site. So this is like a single slice of time. It doesn't mean these fossils were, or these hominins were living at the exact same time. The, the geologic record mixes time up. But let's say this is something like a 10,000 year time slice, which is really good resolution when you are 2.3 million years uh, back in time. Okay? So we can see that there was strong dietary overlap and th that question still remains as to was there an environmental pressure or change in the vegetation or resources available that pushed all the hominins into essentially the same dietary niche. Okay, so to answer that, we decided to actually look at the vegetation. What was the vegetation like? So we have to get out of the teeth and into the ecosystem to understand what the plants were doing. Okay, so we went uh, to the Omo, the place where all these fossils are from. And th these are now uh, biomarkers, which are molecular plant fossils. When plants die, they leave some waxes in the sediment, just like if you have a jade plant at home, you know, they're really waxy. Those waxes actually record whether that plant is a C3 or a C4 plant. So we go and we get these waxes out of ancient sediments from four to one million years. And just as we did with the teeth, we can actually reconstruct the amount of woody to grassy vegetation in the landscape. And so each dot is a measurement from a, a fossil soil where we take the waxes and say, oh, here at this particular point, the landscape was about 30% C4 and 70% C3 vegetation. So the overall trend you can see is moving towards more C4 on the landscape. These are just histograms where we're binning it. It sort of highlights that shift to the right. Okay, we looked at mammal diets, so, you know, elephants, pigs, hippos, rhinos, everything running around. And they, using change point analysis, we see there's a shift here at about 2.7 million years, okay, to more C4 foods. Uh, and then here's the sort of hominin lineage structure at this particular fossil site in the Omo. Uh, you have Australopithecus for a while. Then you start to see the Paranthropus uh, species come in, and then Homo comes in around 2.3, 2.4. Okay, we also have some pretty old stone tools here. Okay, now we have some enamel data from the teeth of the hominins, and we can see that compared to other herbivores, okay, or let's say mammals, we don't know if these were herbivores or not yet. Uh, the dietary shift comes a little bit later. And that's pretty common. Not everybody's gonna change at the same time. Different organisms have different ecologies. Okay, so this shift, I think, can be explained by this shift in, in available resources. We went from having more C3 type woody vegetation on the landscape to more open resources on the landscape. Grasses and things or tubers of those grasses. 
Okay? So to me, that's the best explanation for why perhaps the hominins all got packed into this small dietary niche space over here uh, and then later differentiated again. Okay, so here are some key, key takeaways. We see this vegetation shift at 2.7 and consequently following that, different mammal groups change their diet at different times with hominins all moving up into this more C4 or grassy based diet around 2.4. Uh, whereas on the flip side, some of the herbivores responded right away even earlier to that, okay, so perhaps had more dietary flexibility. Um, so why, why did the hominin diet lag other mammals? Is it interspecific competition? Is it environmental pressure? We don't, we don't know. It's a, it's a really difficult question to answer. Uh, but by collecting more and more data, we start to get at these questions or be able to answer them. Okay. Um, and importantly, the spatial and temporal scales of the vegetation proxy and the diet proxy are similar. So we're following the rules here. Okay, so long awaited, here's my love letter and my conclusions to Paranthropus. Dear Paranthropus, we now know, thanks to isotopes, that through most of your time in Eastern Africa, your diet was based on 65 to 80% C4 resources. You surprised us eating C3 foods and mixed C3 feeding in the OMO. There's a few, few data points that were surprising us. But we know you did this in Malawi too, in the Southern, southern African sites. Um, microware shows you weren't eating hard food, hard food items, low complexity, that's a microware term, uh, but instead tough items. So it was doing more shearing like this, right? Like some of the grass eating mammals. So did you eat meat? I bet not, or not much. Uh, we are going to measure calcium isotopes in your teeth with colleagues uh, Jeremy Martin, Vincent Balter, uh, Pierre-Jean Dodat in Lyon to try to find this out. It's a hard measurement to make, so our French colleagues are doing that. Uh, and my colleague Gildas did the microware. Uh, so we're trying to do some niche breath modeling. Sorry, I'll keep reading. Using microware and isotope data, we hope you don't mind. Uh, we won't call you nutcracker, a nutcracker anymore but your diet and ecology is still a tough nut to crack. <laughs> Yours truly, Kevin, on behalf of my many <laughs> colleagues. Uh, and then P.S. what happened in the OMO from 2.7 to 2.3, dying to know, <laughs> which is this outstanding thing we can't, can't quite figure out, okay? Um, and then I thought I'd just close with, um, in the earth and evolutionary and paleosciences, some of the efforts uh, underway at Harvard and, and in the larger earth science community to um, increase diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism. So this is just some examples at Harvard. Uh, the main thing is to listen, learn, and discuss. Uh, professors are really good at talking. We like to talk a lot. So this is a challenge for me, listening. Uh, and this, these are some of the initiatives we're trying to put forth uh, to increase diversity in the sciences. Uh, we participate in this thing called URGE, Unlearning Racism in the Geosciences. That's a nationwide effort. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing um, is, is training African sciences, African scientists. There's a master's program that is operating in the Turkana Basin. It's the only master's in the entire country of Kenya focused on human evolutionary biology, despite them having probably the best record of human evolution in the world. And this was started by my late colleague, Isaiah Nengo, in 2018. And there have been about nine or 10 graduates. It's a very small cohort, like three a year. But I think out of the nine or 10 graduates, like eight of them are now in PhD programs in the United States or Europe. And they really need this sort of bridging master's program because the undergraduate education is lacking in paleoanthropology, biology, and things like that. And so it's really a way to help them get prepared to enter um, PhD programs uh, in Europe or the US. Uh, and so we do things like train them on how to drill teeth in the museum, this is doing some uh, water isotope extraction at our lab in Kenya. This is building a rainfall collector uh, so we can measure water isotopes of rain. And then a lot of work in the National Museum of Kenya, which hosts perhaps the most wonderful fossil collection in the world for understanding human evolution. Capacity building, that's another big effort, is to actually build labs and infrastructure in Eastern Africa so that 
researchers and students can have access to these uh, facilities and, and be trained uh, in Kenya rather than having to go abroad. So uh, we established this, uh, what's called the Permil Lab, Paleo and Ecohydrology Research, the Impala Isotope Lab. This is the Impala Research Center. It's an ecology-based research center in central Kenya. And so we have this laser water isotope analyzer and we go out and we uh, collect soil. We can extract the moisture from the soil. You can get water out of plants, you can get it out of rivers, out of reservoirs, and then here we are training uh, students in the lab. This is the lab manager, uh, John Gitanga. So capacity building is a big thing. And then uh, teaching. So I, before I came to Harvard, I was at Columbia, and we taught an undergrad course abroad, and they would just, the students would be there for a semester, I would swoop in for three weeks, and we'd do all kinds of uh, ecological studies using water isotopes. This is again extracting water from plants or soils. Uh, we're not logging here. This is a tree that fell uh, next to a river in a storm. The, the stream eroded away the bank and the tree fell. So we cut a slab out to try to do some uh, tree ring like dendroecology stuff uh, using what we had. We study uh, what happens to bones on the landscape, like how to make a fossil, things like that. Uh, and then, of course, we, we hang out with the local kids a lot. They're always interested in what the researchers are doing. Okay, uh, with that, I thank you for your time. I'd be happy to take questions after the attendance check-in. It's a good question. So, uh, you know, the the... Morphological characteristics, again, are this sort of macro evolutionary, like what it was sort of evolved to do and handle. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's what it's actually eating at the time. And so, yes, Paranthropus had much thicker enamel, and that gave it, pro I think, ironically, it gives it more niche breadth or possibility to eat more things <coughs> than Homo, because we don't have the teeth for doing that. Uh, but it had the most restricted diet of all the hominins we've ever looked at using this technique. But I'll give you an example uh, using elephants, right? Elephants have these massively high-crowned teeth, and most high-crowned teeth in the mammal world are evolved for grazing, eating grasses, because teeth wear down when you're eating grasses. They're gritty, and they're just much more abrasive than leaves. So elephants have evolved these really high-crowned teeth, and we know they were eating grasses in the past using this same technique, but today, Loxodonna, the African elephant, both the forest and the savanna elephant, mostly eat browse, they mostly eat trees. So here's a tooth that's evolved, it's specialized to eat grass, it used to, but now it's using it for something else and it's working fine. The only reason elephants are in trouble is us, right? Land use change, poaching, things like that. So teeth can be evolved for one thing but actually do other things and so it's probably more to do with the resources available on the landscape as to why these uh, two hominin genera were collapsed into a particular food type. Yeah. And I will say the isotope method is a little bit broad. We just know it was C4 based. It could have been a wildebeest that was eating only C4 grasses and then we, our ancestors were eating that meat. We can't tell between uh, omnivory, uh, carnivory, we can't differentiate that with trophic level stuff with this particular method. Yeah. These are the national treasures of these countries, and so I would be in jail if I kept them for myself. <laughs> and I'll just tell a quick student vignette, which is one year we were at a stone tool site with the students from Columbia and Princeton, and one student, who shall never be named, uh, slipped a stone tool in their pocket. And they came back here and uh, a year and a half later wrote me and said, Kevin, I can't sleep at night. I've done this thing. What should I do? And so I called my stone tool friend. I was like, we got a situation. <laughs> and he basically said, you should just take it back with you and put it back near, but it's out of context. So what I decided to do is throw it in the lake, at this, at, in the Lake Turkana where it'll probably, hopefully never be found. I don't know. So this person was so guilt ridden that uh, they eventually gave that back. So we always work under a very strict set of rules and guidelines of how we treat the fossil. Before we drill a fossil, we have to ask and get permission from the museum research staff that yes, this one can be drilled because it, it damages the fossil a little bit. But you get good information. Yeah.
Thank you, that was a great talk. Uh, I'm wondering about the isotope ratio itself. It mm. ties to the food that they eat, mm -hmm. but what I'm wondering, throughout that time zone, the organism itself is evolving. And I'm wondering if the fractionation due to the organism itself, mm. can we actually tell something about it? Earlier species versus later species, there's a, you know, carbon or oxygen differences. It's not due to the fact that the environment is getting yeah. big. Basically, organism how picking up 14, 13, yeah. or oxygen isotopes. Okay. It's a really great question. So he's asking like a 300 level, 400 level course question here, which is when you eat something, the carbon gets incorporated in your teeth, the isotopes, but there's a, a shift called a fractionation factor between the diet and the actual mineral tooth that forms. But we've measured that fractionation, that offset across mammals. And the biggest determinant is uh, gut physiology. So unless we become ruminants or we're ruminants and are not now, that's the biggest difference. Um, it's pretty constant. It's about the same across primates. There's, su there's subtle variations on the order of one to two per mil, but not over the course of like three to six to eight per mil that we're seeing. Yeah, good question. The genes that do tooth morphology are famously some of the shovel-shaped molars from the buried stream mm -hmm. were actually modified for vitamin D production in breast tissue, mm. and the change in shape of teeth was secondary. Have you looked at EDAR gene or any of the genes that are involved in producing tooth morphology? Uh, if I knew anything about genes, I might. I, I'm, in, I'm now in a biology department, I'm trained as an earth scientist, yeah. and we're hiring a human geneticist, and I, am, uh, I feel like I'm in genetics 101. So we can look at the modern genes in, in, in primates, and my colleague uh, Leslie Lusko, who took this photo, is actually looking at um, genes in primates to try to understand the uh, phenotypic variation and which genes turn off which aspects of molar morphology. Um, she's in, in Spain at an institute uh, there, but I, I have not. And for like ancient DNA, we can't, we can't get that far back into millions of years. We can go back, say, 50 or 60,000 years. But Africa has proved um, remarkably challenging for ancient DNA because of the heat. So the only ancient genomes that have been published from there come from high up in the mountains where it's cooler. Uh, all the sort of lowland sites, the proteins at the end, everything's baked. Yeah, so great suggestion, way out of my field of expertise. Yeah, I think it's really interesting though, even if you could do it at a phylogenetic level. I will say, we have just recovered some ancient proteins out of tooth enamel going back to 29 million years. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, these are small proteins, but like enamel proteins, uh, dentin proteins, so they are preserved, but they're smaller snippets and I don't know that it's it's not the gene it's just a protein but it's a step forward yeah that's a pretty that has not been challenged in any major way, at least for the early hominins. Uh, the waves of, out of Africa, there was an early Homo erectus at 1.7 million years, and then uh, later Homo sapiens left. And so there's still a lot of debate about the timing and the nature. Was it a push or a pull? And what were the conditions like? Uh, but yeah, it's not really a question as to where hominins evolved at this point. It's just how they left and when. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. So the board is around. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so you showed a figure with uh, two skeletons of so mm -hmm. and Homo and um, said that the leg bones uh, were much smaller. Mm -hmm. They have like shorter, shorter, shorter legs, but pretty much longer arms, I think, yeah. or proportionally. And then the shaded areas of the, of the bones were the only 
bones that have been actually observed. Found, yeah. How do they know that their legs are short if they found <laughs> Yeah, this is like a, a major reconstruction effort. You're talking about this diagram, yeah? Yes. Uh, so you can tell a lot. So here they have, I guess, two femoral heads, and you probably, I'm not a morphologist, not a paleontologist, I'm a wannabe. Uh, so th this is fully reconstructed, the tib-fib. There's some ankly bone here, you know, whoop de doo But here, they're probably using the, the morphology of the femoral head, and maybe the, the thickness of the cortical bone, I'm not sure. I, I tend to trust most paleontologists on this stuff. The way they talk about bones is, you know, they're not, they're not making this stuff up. But it's true, we could, use a lot, we could use a lot more of this skeleton. This is actually us. This is just a homo sapien, your average human. So um, it, this really drives home the point of how incomplete the fossil record is. Yeah. Hand bones would be great. Is there a thumb there? Can't tell. So if I got this correct, it sounded like for a period um, everybody was kind of more converging on the C4, right? mm -hmm. and then, but then after, once we got past 2.2 million years ago, then the homogeneous, like, did we go back to more C3? Mm -hmm. And um, are we still, I mean, we still have grasses, <laughs> right, but um, was that because we started eating more foods from trees, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, our great innovation, I think, what most people would argue is that. Where's the. Whoa, it doesn't shine on there? It's because of the screen. Whoa. <laughs> uh, is, so we're, we're not fully C3, you can see here. We're kind of mixed. And what uh, I think the most popular evolutionary theory now is we. Homo figured out a way to have these very generalist diets. and that's been interpreted as flexibility and perhaps the reason why Homo became a very successful lineage and Paranthropus who was kind of packed in at the upper end of that uh, dietary range uh, eventually went extinct. But we still don't know but the way people like to tell the story is in this ever increasingly harsh environment in Eastern Africa as it became more arid, more grassy, more resource limited or at least drier um, we found a way to expand our niche breadth, and then you add like carnivory and hunting and stone tools, and, and that really changes the game. But we think that Paranthropus may have been using stone tools as well. Again, these are some of the great and many unanswered questions. Any other questions, Dr. Yu? Actually, I have one, and it's maybe totally outside of your field of expertise. Uh, the maps you're showing us and the incomplete fossil record that you remind us about. Has anyone sort of made an estimate 2.2 million years ago how many of these organisms were alive? Mm. Well, the, probably the best way to do that is just to look in a, at a fossil site, the, the record. Okay, how many fossils do we have here? What are they? And the general rule is at most sites, hominins make up less than 1% of what we find. So there is this conundrum of how these lineages survive, both of them for a million years or more, for us millions of years, 2.6, and existed at such low numbers throughout the record. And you know, now population, we have a different problem with population. Uh, but it, they were low, we know that, that they were low, but I don't know if there's been a number. People talk about thousands. And with ancient DNA, you can look at relatedness and like uh, this thing runs of homozygosity, who's, who's marrying who and breeding. So in the more near term, we have records of that, but that far back, it's, it's much more unconstrained, the estimates. Sort of on that, uh, you know, what are the characteristics of Death of a person or an individual that causes the Is there a Oh, just get buried. Get buried fast. And not in a box. So that, could that be river? I'm yeah. wondering about lifestyles and where they live. Oh, there's, there's a huge bias in the fossil record. And that's what we do with the students. We say, okay, let's look at this fossil. What's happened to it? Have carnivores come and not on it? Blah, blah, blah. And then is this going to be a fossil? And if it's in the highlands, the uplands, there's no way it's going to get buried. And the sun usually just 
blasts away the, the sun, the wind, the rain, soil acidity. So the key is that oftentimes there's a site that Sarah and I work at where every other step you're smashing a hippo or a croc. And it's a hippo or a croc because these are ancient river deposits and so naturally the things that actually live there are the ones that are most often fossilized. So there's a bias in the record for things that we're using river environments, lake environments, where you have burial sedimentation processes happening. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you.